Minnesota Pioneer presents Small Batch Science, Episode 2. Hi, I'm Andy, and today we're going to talk about uh, ivory tools from Pleistocene or early Paleo Indian sites across North America. Um, really, just a quick overview because there's a lot of ground to cover, but I'll mention a few things um, about the history of finds and um, where they come from in the old world and how we should uh, sort of anticipate some of the things we find here in the Americas. This is a cast not actually from Clovis, but a very similar uh, pair of these things were found in 1936 embedded in a mammoth outside of Clovis, New Mexico in the excavations by E.B. Howard and um, John Cotter, along with half a dozen or so of what we now recognize as Clovis points. And this is one of the two uh, diagnostic type specimens from, from those days. They um, pretty clearly were found in context that indicate that the, the bone examples were in fact points, not foreshafts, and, and that's probably a, a lengthy discussion we could have at another time on, in and of itself, just a fairly controversial topic within archaeology. Um, but the point being, we've known about these as part of the Clovis toolkit from day one in the 1930s. Three of the ivory tools here in Florida were actually found in 1927 and are you know, that they've been known for a little bit longer. They were probably not recognized as ivory immediately, though. That took a, a little while for that to come around. Archaeologically on the planet, um, ivory objects as old as almost 40,000 years old. This is one of the Venus figurines from Dolne Vestanice in the Czech Republic. Um, exaggerated body parts and such. Um, notice she's wearing a crocheted hat, which is a really kind of interesting thing. But a, a very elaborate ivory figurine and just one of many that are known, probably a hundred or close to it now, um, 36, 38,000 years old. This is probably my new favorite artifact I know of on the planet. This is a non-returning boomerang, probably best called a, a throwing stick, except it's made out of nearly a pound of mammoth ivory and even has a little uh, um, line, line zigzag design on one side of it. And we are filming in front of a live studio audience. But it's a pretty clear indication from nearly 30,000 years ago out of Poland that people were worrying about aerodynamics and uh, elaborate performance of flying objects. The point being here, really, that however complicated, convex, um, intricate, and, and interesting the toolkit in the Americas is, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise to us. Older examples on the order of 15, maybe 20,000 years older than the earliest stuff we have in the Americas are, are equally, if not noticeably, more elaborate, and that the behavior of physically and intellectually modern Homo sapiens sapiens in, in the New World uh, really should never surprise us. This is just a quick view of a photograph of most of the kinds of ivory tools that are known from Florida. We could probably bog down and do a, a separate show on each one of the tools and, and what we think about them and what they mean to us all, but right now I'm just going to sort of run through a bunch of the different kinds of tools and just sort of say what they are or what we think they are, really that's probably the more appropriate way to address that, and show you a couple of interesting um, points about them and mention in passing that the toolkit, or the number of them that we know of, is actually growing from some recent finds that have um, come to light. So, the vast majority of these tools, and I unfortunately, unfortunately no longer have a very good cast of it because the point broke off, um, are about a foot long, curved with the haft element on the outside, and are probably not launched like on an atolatl dart or on a spear, but are probably handheld uh, thrusting weapons. Like I said, almost all a foot long, maybe a little bit longer. Here's one that we found in six fragments and managed to glue it all together. It's uh, almost 13 inches long and it's missing probably four inches on it. So obviously that's not gonna fly very well. In, in every example we've been able to determine or examine, the haft is on the outside of that curve. Uh, most similar to maybe a uh, tine on a pitchfork perhaps is what, what I've suggested in um, Clovis Technology, which has got the, sort of pu the published version of, of um, that part of my dissertation. Long curved ones, 25 to 12 centimeters, so uh, about this long to here, 
that are straight and, and don't have that curve. If you're shorter than 25 centimeters, they're all straight. Um, down to about 12 centimeters or a little under four inches is the, are the sort of smallish ones on, the, on what I think are probably addle addle dark points. One of them being barbed that was found in the Oscilla a number of years ago. Uh, pretty clearly a point. <laughs> Um, there's a mending piece to that and it, with broken pieces, you know, mended where they do, comes right out to 25 centimeters and that's where we sort of get the upper limit for that. Um, most of them that I've shown casts of are round in cross section, but it turns out they're really more likely to be oval in cross section and hopefully that shows up pretty well. There's one that's, again, doubly unique. It's square in cross section. It's splintered pretty badly so you can barely just see that between my fingers that it's square, and it has uh, scoring for a beveled haft on both ends of it. You can see a pretty good example of the beveled haft here. One thing that's really important about this one from the Silver River, right at um, outside where the Silver River Museum is these days, is that this haft is shrunk. It's smaller than the diameter of the point, and would have made it so that when it was hafted to a piece of wood, and you you know put cordage or, or sinew around it and lashed it it would have been basically seamless. The, the, the cordage would have then made it the same diameter. It would have been really a, an incredibly strong way of doing that. So, short points, long points, a couple of smaller tools, including um, an awl, and then this is pictured here, and there's one of two now, no, now known ivory needle tips from Sloth Hole in the Osceola. Uh, important component of, of sewing, obviously, and probably means tailored clothing. 13,000 years ago in Florida if they wanted it. Um, other things include a barb that would have just been hafted and lashed. There's, there's an area for scoring on the back and it would probably sit up like that. Probably used in a similar kind of fashion as this. We're not positive, we don't, we don't know. Um, a broken piece from Sloth Hole that you can see even in the cast, the, the lines from within the structure of the tusk and it's a curved grooved and polished little piece of ivory that may be like a um, what gets called a paint pot made out of antler that turns up with some regularity here in Florida but it appears to be an ivory example from an animal that's been gone for at least 13,000 years. Now we'll get and sort of finish with my favorite couple. This is a broken midsection of one of these longer probably curved shafts that was reworked into an atlatl hook very similar to the one shown here. And then atlatl is the uh, word we use for a, a, a form of a stick <laughs> with a hook on it that's used to launch darts. So you launch an atlatl dart by you know, putting it on the hook and throwing. That technology in Europe is at least 17,000 years old and we suspect that it's probably closer to 40,000 years old. So finding it at 13,000 years old in Florida is very exciting and we're very pleased to do so, but it, again, should not be a huge surprise to us. And I'll finish with my favorite artifact on the table. Yes, I am lifting a complete mastodon tusk with two fingers. And I admit it's a cast, but I could do it anyway. This is a vestigial tusk from a mastodon. And all that means is the normal eight foot tusks you think of when you go to the museum and see them um, come out of the top of the skull. And once in a while in mastodons, those teeth are not completely gone, they show up as little tiny ones, but as I say, vestigial or, or just sort of a relic. Somebody made an atlatl hook out of one. They split it down the middle so that it would sit slightly elevated when they wanted it, split it, and then carved the heck out of the back of it after they split it, and you can see that based on you know where they are. Um, in the order of what occurred, and then used it as a hook like this. And the evidence for that is right on the end where the wear and the battering that occurs from using these as atlatl hooks is entirely consistent with experimental examples of uh, antler, ivory, and uh, bone. And again, uh, just a quick and dirty overview of a part of the toolkit that is not as commonly seen as stone clovis to points and other stone tools that are much more durable and much more likely to survive in the archaeological record. But of the known worked ivory pieces in North, in, in North America, 
greater than 90, maybe 95 percent of them are from right here in Florida, an awful lot of them came out of a couple of sites that I've worked extensively in um, the Osceola River, and so we'll revisit them a lot, and I'll do another ivory tool period piece where we get into some of the nuts and bolts about what we can really learn from these things. So thank you for watching Small Batch Science, and tune in, we'll have another episode soon.